This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. All right. Um, thank you for having me here. I have no disclosures. Um, so as I was thinking about this talk, you know, because it has to be uh, brief, what I thought I would do is I would focus on antibiotic um, selection for diabetic wounds um, and sort of how I like to think about antibiotics in general and what I do in what I do. Um, I'm borrowing a lot of what I'm going to be talking about from the um, IDSA clinical practice guidelines. Has anyone ever seen these guidelines, looked at them, read them? Okay. Um, I don't know what you thought. I find them useful but very, very broad, and I think that just underlines that there's huge, huge variability in what can be done and in what people do, and so it can end up being a little bit confusing. So a lot about what I'm going to say is really sort of my personal preference. So when I think about antibiotics, basically I think of my gram negatives and my gram positives, and when I'm selecting an empiric regimen, really what I'm thinking is how far in, and is there a cursor? Yeah, how far in each direction do I need to go, right? Um, and so at the end of the spectrum, you can think of having Pseudomonas here as your gram negatives and MRSA here as your gram positives. Um, and the, the reason why I bring that up is because if you think about those two, you're going to have very few gaps in between. And so I always think, do I need to cover MRSA? Do I need to cover Pseudomonas? And then do I need to cover um, anaerobes? And this actually holds for like a lot of infections, not just the diabetic foot. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about skin and soft tissue infections, and then I hope to focus a little bit more on osteo, because I think osteomyelitis is the harder one to treat. Um, but with skin soft tissue infections, you know, the, the way that we think about it is if they're mild, um, you really only have to cover gram positives, and, and you don't really have to worry that much about gram negatives. And then there's a little bit of a question on what is a mild tissue, you know, infection, but basically if it's localized to skin and subcutaneous tissue, maybe a little bit of cellulitis, but the patient is like not sick in the hospital. Um, and so gram positive coverage is going to be sufficient. And if there's pus or an open wound, you have to think about staph aureus. Um, and so clindamycin or um, trimethoprim and sulfamthoxazole are going to be your go-tos. If there's no pus, um, a lot of times, especially with cellulitis, we attribute this to group A strep, which is nice because you can use a first-generation cephalosporin and you don't really have to worry about MRSA coverage. Um, and then there really isn't like a fixed duration of therapy, um, you know, like this five days, seven days, 14 days. I treat until it's better. And so you kind of have to make it up because you're not necessarily going to see the patient. But, but I think most ID people just kind of make it up on a guess of what they think is going to be the, the best course of therapy. And then for severe infections, you sort of start thinking more in terms of polymicrobial infections. Um, and so this is, you know, extensive cellulitis, myositis, necrotizing infections. And you do start to have to think a little bit about clus. Where's the pointer? Is there like a laser? Oh, here it is. So clostridia, right? Um, so with your necrotizing infections, you kind of want to think about that. So in the hospital, you know, your easiest thing is going to be vancomycin and an anti-pseudomonal with anaerobic coverage, so something like piptazo, and so that's where that comes from. Um, so osteomyelitis. Um, so it is a multidisciplinary approach. Um, I very, very, like rarely treat osteomyelitis without having a surgeon um, with me. I, I suspect it's a little bit different with you guys, and you guys probably treat it <laughs> without having us uh, on board, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but we don't. <laughs> and, and, I really, and I really don't like to because, you know, the, the, the feeling is that you need debridement to really get devitalized necrotic bone out of there for, to, for there to be cure. Um, I don't know, like, how 
true that is in the sense that if you, you know, when I was reading through things, there was some suggestion that you get you could get away with treating in the absence of debridement, but I, I would really question that at all times. And I think, honestly, if they get better without debridement, I would even question the diagnosis of, of osteomyelitis, but that's me. Um, so, so IV versus oral therapy. Um, I think IV therapy is quite common, um, especially if a patient is in the hospital, right? Because they're right there, you can just put in a PICC line, it's super easy, and then they go home. But, but there really is like nothing to say that IV therapy is superior to oral therapy, as long as you're picking certain oral antibiotics that we know have a good track record for treating bone infections, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Um, you often need a combination of antibiotics, and I'll explain that in a second. And then culture data really is very, very helpful when we are trying to determine a regimen. Um, and the way that I think about it, at least, is to me, a diabetic foot infection or diabetic osteo is polymicrobial generally. So, so there's generally a lot of bugs in there, and you're going to try and select the most um, sort of important pathogens, but you're not necessarily always going to get everything. And so for me, really, what the, the culture does is it helps me determine how broad I'm going to go, because I don't think you need to cover MRSA like every single time, or I don't think you need to cover Pseudomonas every single time, but if you isolate it in culture, then you probably should cover it. And then um, the other thing is optimal duration is not well defined. Um, so, you know, there's this thing about six weeks of antibiotic therapy um, when there's residual infection, you know, after surgery, but there, there's nothing about that that's set in stone. So sometimes if healing is being very slow, you know, you may need to extend the antibiotics um, as we go along. And so that's, that's sort of why I often like oral antibiotics, because I feel like it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of what to do. And so again, I, I think about them in terms of what my gram positive and my gram negative agents are. And the first line agents are gonna be ones that we, I know, are tried and true. There's been a lot of studies done using them, showing that you can achieve a cure. And you know that they have good bioavailability and good penetration. Um, and so for, oops, sorry, let me go back. So for the gram positive, specifically MRSA, so Bactrim and clindamycin are going to be sort of your, your go-tos. And at least at our hospital, um, we tend to have better susceptibilities to um, Bactrim, so we'll often use that um, as a first line. And then for your gram negatives, the ones that really have very good bone penetration are the fluoroquinolones and metronidazole, which really only covers anaerobes. Second line agents, um, doxycycline, we use a fair bit, but the truth is, is we don't really know how good doxycycline is. And then um, linazolid, um, have people here used linazolid much? Yeah, so, so linazolid is great in the sense that, I, you know, it's oral, it's absorbed very well, it works very well, but you can only really use it for about two weeks because you're going to run into problems with bone marrow suppression. So, so it's not great for these, like, really prolonged courses, but for a short course, you might be able to get away with it. And then a mox clav or augmentin, um, I think is popular because it has good gram positives, good gram negatives, and like good anaerobic coverage. But the truth is, is there's not great bone penetration. And so for someone who really has like a big osteo, I, I would be a little hesitant to use it unless, you know, it were someone who, you needed a simple regimen for whatever reason, unless it's going to be more, so you're just going to put them on Augmentin, but it wouldn't necessarily be my go-to. So I just had a couple of cases that I thought maybe would um, bring this point, or like sort of bring this, sort of bring to illustrate how I would go about this. So 71-year-old man, diabetes, and he has a right second toe infection, instead of supposed to debridement, and he has residual osteo. And so sent for cultures, and they grow Klebsiella and E. coli. 
So when I see that, I don't think, oh, he only has Klebsiella and E. coli, right? I just sort of think, oh, that's some of the stuff that, that he has there. And in general, MRSA or Staph aureus should grow. And so since it's not there, I'm going to assume I don't need to cover those. And so you still want some relatively broad spectrum coverage, but you don't necessarily need to go to the extremes. And so I've just listed a couple of potential choices. Sorry. I guess, I guess I can't point, but anyways. So if you wanted to go IV, you could do ceftriaxone or, or erdopenem. Both of them are easy. They're once a day. Like, Or if you wanted to do oral, you could consider Bactrim if it's um, if the Klebsiella or the E. coli are susceptible, or a fluoroquinolone. And, and I say fluoroquinolone not because of the pseudomonas coverage, but just because it's going to get the job done in terms of penetration and, and you know getting to the bone. So second case. Um, same case, except this time there's MRSA in the culture. And so this is really where it starts getting like less elegant. And I would say that a lot of our antibiotic choices for diabetic <laughs> osteo are not very elegant. Um, and, so, and so because here you really do have to cover MRSA and the other stuff. Um, and so an oral regimen, for example, um, might be, you know, you could maybe get away with Bactrim if the Klebs and the E. coli were susceptible, but often they're not. So often you have to do Bactrim plus the fluoroquinolone to really sort of get both. And so patients leave on two um, antibiotics. And, and I, I have Moxie on here because Moxie of all the fluoroquinolones has the best anaerobic coverage. Um, and so, you know, if you're going to use one, I would probably try to use that one, although a lot of times patients need prior auths and it gets a little bit tricky. And then the last case um, is pretty much similar. Let me see. So 71-year-old man, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and then right second toe infection, um, status post debridement with residual osteomyelitis. And so the culture grows MRSA and pseudomonas. And so here you need to cover both, um, you know, gram positives and gram negatives. Um, and so if you wanted to go down the oral route here, you probably wouldn't be going for Bactrim because we get a little bit nervous about um, hyperkalemia in these patients. The other thing I will say about Bactrim is um, you want to kind of push the dose for um, foot infections and for bone infections. So, you know, you do the dosing based on how much trimethropin there, there is in it, and you kind of want to get people to 8 to 10 mg per kg per day. This can be very difficult to do, um, and in someone with chronic kidney disease, it's almost, it's, it's going to be a setup for problems. So I would shy away a little bit from that. And so if I wanted to do oral, I might do something like clindamycin or moxifloxacin. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, so when I think about diabetic foot infections, you know, I try to determine how deep they are. Um, and with osteo, I, I do try to consider oral therapy. Um, and, you know, I do like seeing cultures, and I think the idea is multidisciplinary, and, you know, we're always happy to assist with antibiotics, especially if patients run into, you know, issues or side effects or whatnot. So that's it. Questions?